they'll let you do that in the third world. They've got, they've got a different, you know, different attitude to safety in the third world. Yeah, non-existent. <laughs> you know, you can go, oh, can I lean over the edge of the volcano just, just hanging onto a bit of vegetation? Can I do that? And like that. Of course you can, mate, of course you can. I'll hang on to your flip-flops if you want. <laughs> Would you like a photograph of a tiger? <laughs> Is it in a cage? No, I've tied it to that bicycle over there. Tied a tiger to a bicycle. Would you like to play with this disease riddled monkey? When I saw you, I thought, there's a man that wants to play with a disease riddled, bitey, scratchy, multivirus infected monkey. I stayed in a wonderful hotel this year. Very helpful Polish staff, efficient Polish chambermaids, and some very friendly Polish waiters. The Dorchester, I think it was called. It's been said that a cheap and easy way to get people to laugh at your joke is to throw in a swear word. But I think that's bollocks. Swearing can, however, be an important part of a comic's repertoire. It reinforces the idea that he's somehow breaking taboos. And by laughing at the comic's foul language, the individual audience members are confirming their group's identity by sort of saying, aren't we all being naughty here together? The reason we're talking about it here is that swearing is just another type of surprise, at least when it's used sparingly. Use it too much, though, and it begins to lose its power, like a mobility scooter, and then you have to plug it in again. Look, this metaphor really isn't working. Here's Kevin Bridges. Is everybody having a good credit crunch? Everybody, <laughs> everybody enjoying it? I don't really know what happened. No, I just remember everything just became really expensive, right? And you never asked any questions. You just get charged astronomical prices just to be told, oh, yeah, that's the credit crunch, right? But the final straw for me, I was in a shop, right? And I was buying a packet of bikers. <laughs> a packet of space radars. <laughs> and a packet of Johnny's onion rings. <laughs> now imagine my shock when the guy asked me for 45 pence. <laughs> now when 10p crisps are costing 15p, <laughs> that's when I began to take an interest in economics. <laughs> That's when I started watching Bloomberg and you know, reading the Financial Times, you know, the footsies up on the Dow Jones, who knows what that means, but it's all I'm out of time for, we're paying a quid for a chomp. <laughs> I don't come from like, a wealthy background, but I don't come from a poor background. I was never, I was always the kind of in-between guy. Like, remember the first day, the first day back at school, after the summer holidays, that, that was the day you found out what class you were in. I don't mean educationally. I mean, socially. Right, no, you'd, I would never look at the rich kids that would... I was never one of them that would come strolling in and have a suntan <laughs> in a new school bag. But I was never one of the ones that would come in with like, a black eye and a, a new second name. <laughs> Remember him, you'd need to ask your teacher. You'd be going, sir, how come eh, Jamie Cosgrove's now called Jamie De La Cruz? Oh, that's because his mums are dirty. <laughs> Sweets have changed a lot since my day. Then it used to be wagon wheels, spangles and space dust. Now, ten-year-olds can't get enough WKD poppers and meow meow. Before we get off the subject of swearing, I want to point out that it still has the power to shock even in our swear-rich society. Until Russell Brand had the temerity to ring up an old man, the vast majority of complaints received by the BBC related to swearing. Back in the 1970s, American comedy legend George Carlin wrote a famous routine called Seven Words You Can Never Say on Television. And it's a testament to the enduring power of swearing that I'm still not allowed to play that clip for you today. If you're interested, though, I'll attempt to tell you the seven words by merely alluding to them. OK, here goes. There's and can I say I'm allowed, I can't say, but I'm allowed to say, I'm not allowed to say. They'll beat that as well. Really? I think we might be saying something dreadful in Morse code. Here's Stuart Francis. My wife and I have decided we don't want children. If anybody does, we can drop them off tomorrow. <laughs> I'm serious. Please? The fat one has asthma. Now, I'm not ashamed of my wife. If you don't believe me, go to the car and ask her. She's in the boot. 
two types of people I hate are racists and Norwegians. Especially the black ones. I don't like them at all. That's what I love about this part of the world. Irony, it's everywhere. Today I slapped a homeless person so hard, my charm bracelet fell off. That is rich. Irony, Sharon Osbourne judges talent. <laughs> George Carlin wasn't all about the swears, though. He once said stand-up comedy is the only art form where the audience is included in the act of creation. This goes back to what we were saying earlier about comedy being a shared experience, but also underlines the fact that one of the most important ingredients of any joke is the audience that hears it. That might sound a bit like metaphysical mumbo-jumbo, but it isn't really. Just as a stranger to your office wouldn't get your jokes about your fat boss or slaggy Julie from accounts, and God, she is a slag, so you might not get many jokes told to you by a Norwegian satirist, even if he had impeccable English. Because any half-decent stand-up comic will shape his act as he goes along to the cues given out by his audience, we can see that George Carlin is right. When I'm up on stage, it's not just about me. It's also, to a large extent, about the audience. But mainly, it's about me. I just want to make that absolutely clear. Here's Mike Wilmot. What can I tell you about Mike? Uh, he's Canadian. Uh, second name, Wilmot? Yeah, that'll do. Mike Wilmot. I think because I come out to Britain about half the year, I now acquire an English accent when I come home. It sounds a bit more theatrical than drunk. You know, standing outside, hello, my love, hello. <laughs> I'm home, my love. Then I do her voice. Have you been drinking? Which is right on the money. That's how men impersonate women. Which is fair. I've heard women impersonate men. Then he says, so. Have you been drinking? No. <laughs> Your beauty alone intoxicates me. I have two beautiful children, two great daughters. They're uh, stepkids, but I pay for them, so they're mine. <laughs> Good kids, athletic children, thin kids, because I'm a fat dad, that's how you get thin kids. I like to promote physical fitness by walking around in my underwear a lot, that seems to work. <laughs> Sitting on the couch, scratching my balls, eating peanuts, they've been doing sit-ups since they were three. There are so many new accents these days. There's estuary English, uh, Midlands Burr, West Country Colloquial, and the technical name for how I speak, which is properly. One more thing that's worth mentioning in our unscientific tour around the ingredients of a joke is rhythm. Again, this is a bit meta. We're not talking about the words or content here, but good stand-up comedy has got an almost poetic quality to it. One of the reasons that Ireland has produced so many great comics is that the Irish people have a special rhythm to their speech, which makes it ideal for telling funny stories. That and the fact that with its late hours and bar-based working environment, comedy is the perfect profession for a nation of drunks. Dimitri Martin isn't drunk or Irish, but his speech does have an almost musical rhythm to it, which makes it almost impossible not to get sucked in. Here he is. I like digital cameras because they enable you to reminisce immediately. <laughs> Just like, Psh, look at us. <laughs> you were so young. <laughs> Standing right there, wow. Where does the minute go? I think vests are all about protection. Like the life vest protects you from drowning. And the bulletproof vest protects you from getting shot. And the sweater vest protects you from pretty girls. <laughs> Leave me alone, can't you see I'm cold just right here? I don't like thank you cards because I don't know what else to say. What do I put on the inside? Man. See front. If you're lost and you have a map, people are inclined to help. But I find that it's a different story when you have a globe. Hi, could you tell me where the mall is? I want to launch a globe into space just to mess with astronauts. <laughs> Captain, we're way further than I thought. Whenever I see an autobiography for sale in the bookstore, I just flip to the about the author section. I'm like, done, next. 
I got some new pajamas with uh, pockets in them. Which is great because before that, I used to have to hold stuff when I slept. Now I'm like, where's my planner? Oh, there it is. Keep sleeping. All right, I'm right on schedule. Perfect. Wish I had a pajama backpack for all this other stuff. Well, there you have it. They were just some of the ingredients that go to make up a great joke. Sure, my list wasn't comprehensive, and maybe we could have gone with a bit more detail. But as a blagger's guide, I think we got it covered. Before we go, here's Bill Bailey. But first, Mickey Flanagan, proving that you don't have to be Irish to be a rhythm king. I actually come from the East End of London. Like most East End kids, I messed up my education because they left the gate open. <laughs> I went to a tough inner city comp with low expectations. In the third year, the careers officer turned up and he asked us what we'd like to do with our lives. The most ambitious kid in the class is Gary Utton because he wants to drive a van. We erupted. We're like, you dream, Rutten. <laughs> you is never going to drive a van. <laughs> you have to write to Jimmy Savile for that stuff, man. <laughs> no kid from this school has ever gone on to drive a van. <laughs> Come on, Rutten, you know why this school is here. This school is here to produce the people who carry the stuff. To the van. <laughs> I used to buy my chips from an oppressive chip shop regime. The girl who worked there, she seemed happy, but I knew it was not what it seemed. Uh, do you want salt and vinegar? Was what they made us say. But in the language of the ghetto, that means help, I'm a woman in chains. I wanted to free her. In my dreams, I would see her running naked through the woods round Rainham. If I had some tigers, I'd train them. To protect her. From the sexual fascism that was lurking round the gherkins. Yeah. I'd lean across the counter and we would talk. I carved the name Debbie on a little wooden fork. But into the shop came a skinhead gang. They snatched the fork from my hand. Debbie, she looked at me to assert my masculinity. I said, Oi! I said, What? I said, Nothing. Thank you. Thanks for listening. See you next time. That was Jimmy Carr's Comedy Cuts with me, Jimmy Carr. It was written by me and Dom English and was produced by Paul Russell. This was an open mic production for BBC Radio 2.